This winter, Britain ground to a halt in the snow for the second time in 12 months. And this year, the Arctic temperatures lasted much longer than last year. It makes you wonder what's happening to our weather. In Britain's big freeze, I want to find out what causes extreme snow events in this country. I'll experience firsthand the effects of severe cold and snow on the human body. I mean, you wouldn't last long, would you? And I want to understand whether Britain should brace itself for more freezing conditions. Snow. Pure, beautiful, but deadly. When Britain froze to a halt in February last year, scientists said it was a once-in-20-year event. This winter, the same thing happened again. Britain was brought to its knees by the longest cold spell for nearly three decades. I'm a lecturer in geography at Oxford University, and I want to discover the truth about what's happening to our weather. Are our winters getting colder? I want to find out what goes on up there that creates all this down here. Much of the UK's weather, particularly in the winter, is like this battle between fire and ice. This extraordinary image, taken earlier this year, tells the story. From Scotland to Cornwall, Britain was covered in ice and snow. Up and down the country, the snow was causing chaos. Nearly 9,000 schools were closed. 16 airports shut down and panic buyers stripped the supermarket shelves bare. The big freeze also hit our leisure time. It halted filming on soap operas and struck at the very heart of the nation, the football. This is Colchester United's ground. They haven't played here for more than two weeks. The snow is, well, it's almost six inches deep. And more than that, the ground's rock solid. I wouldn't fancy doing a sliding tackle on this. It only takes a few inches. The snow caused thousands of accidents on our streets and motorways. Despite the authorities' best efforts, snow still causes chaos and confusion for millions. Even new technology succumbed to old enemies. It all started to go wrong in December, when high-speed Eurostar trains sped through blizzards en route to the Channel Tunnel. No one could have predicted what would happen. The weather led to five trains breaking down inside the tunnel. Fine, powdery snow and a strong wind conspired to penetrate crucial filters on the locomotives. Once inside, the fine snow melted and shorted electrical circuits, disabling the locos and leaving hundreds stranded inside the Channel Tunnel. If you are going to be stranded in severe weather, there are better places than a motorway or a tunnel. Perched on top of the Yorkshire Dales is the Tan Hill Inn. At 1,732 feet above sea level, it's Britain's highest inn. It's a popular spot for New Year's Eve parties, only this one went on rather longer than they expected. Today, in this snow, the only way up is by foot. It's three or four miles, mostly uphill. Very beautiful, very serene. But when the wind's blowing and the snow's up in your eyes, it will also be extremely dangerous, be very easy to wander off the track. So I can quite understand why you'd stay in a nice warm bar and let that party continue. <laughs> you must be mad. <laughs> it's cold out there. You better get by the fire. Thank you very much. 
he had a rather lengthy New Year's Eve party here. <laughs> Extended. <laughs> Extended, yes. <laughs> How many days were people stuck here? Three nights, four days, was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody had to bring air beds and sleep on the floor. Why couldn't people leave? How bad were the conditions? It'd be seven foot high, in drifts. Seven feet deep? It was treacherous. Mm. So stay put, let the party continue. Outside temperatures were a biting minus five Celsius, intensified by ferocious winds of up to 66 miles per hour. It wasn't just the New Year's revellers at the Tanhill Inn who found themselves stuck. All over Britain, people living in remote communities were cut off by the heavy drifting snow. But as we all know, this isn't exactly the first time we've experienced snowy conditions. It was only back in February 2009 that Britain experienced the heaviest snowfall for 18 years. The story started the month before the snow arrived, in January 2009. Winds were mild, almost balmy. Temperatures were 8 to 10 degrees. For the Met Office, this was about average for the time of year. Britain is kept warm most winters because we have the Gulf Stream. So when the winds are coming in off the Atlantic, that means that for our latitude, we're actually quite mild compared to the rest of the world. But by mid-January last year, a new and curious weather pattern suddenly developed. It was high above the Arctic Circle and pushing freezing air south towards the UK. At the same time, there was a movement of moist air coming up from France. The Met Office forecasters feared if these two weather systems clashed, it would trigger an Arctic freeze. February 2009 was fairly straightforward. Light winds, clear skies, temperatures dropped rapidly during the night, and that's what starts it off. And the snow falls. Instead of falling as rain as it would do if it was mild, it falls as snow. Last year, the Met Office prediction was right. In early February, a freezing blizzard hit London and the southeast before moving on to paralyse the rest of the country. For much of England, there was more snow than they'd seen for 20 years. On slippery streets, the traffic began to grind to a halt. Even London's buses, which operated valiantly throughout the Blitz, were suspended for the weather for the first time in history. And to add to the misery, most of London's tube lines were closed. 45 minutes. But some people believed there were reasons to be cheerful. Out of the face of adversity came the positives. The unique thing about snow is that it's actually good fun for most people. There were gloom merchants, of course, saying it's cost the country £1.2 billion. But this is the computer age, for goodness sake. You could still have a snowball fight and still work from home as well. It's great. Both years, something else snowbound Britain could do from home was shop. One online retailer sold 27,000 sledges as many took to the snow-covered slopes. Pizza delivery increased by 30% as others sheltered inside from the cold. And sales of carrots were up. After all, they are an essential feature of every snowman. So, what were the causes of these two extreme weather events? Well, both last winter and this saw the conditions for the perfect winter storm. Usually, Britain is exposed to mild westerly winds off the Atlantic. But both this winter and last, this normal pattern was disrupted by events in Arctic regions, leading to the mild winds being replaced with freezing easterlies. This winter's weather, so far at least, has been coming essentially from the east, which means that winds coming in from the cold continent has kept the UK cold, quite similar to even February 2009. That sort of short spell of cold weather was quite similar. In 2009, this was down to a rapid temperature rise high above the North Pole in the stratosphere. 
It reversed the normal flow of westerly winds down through the atmosphere and led to freezing easterlies blowing from Siberia and the continent over the UK. This winter, the westerly winds were disrupted again, bringing freezing air south across northern Europe. In both years, Britain was exposed to icy Arctic conditions. So why didn't the forecasters see the big freeze coming? Seasonal forecasting is, is a relatively new thing for us, and what we're trying to do is provide information on the risks and probabilities of rainfall patterns or of temperature patterns across the UK over a season. Now, it is very experimental, but what we've got to remember is if we say there's a 60% chance of it being warmer than average, that leaves a 40% chance of it being colder than average. So you've got to be very careful how you use this kind of information in planning. So yes, it's developmental. Yes, we're still working on it. Yes, it hasn't been great over the past year or so, but previous years it was excellent. It seems for the moment at least we should take long-range forecasts with a pinch of salt. Both this winter and last, snow hasn't been the only hazard unleashed by the freezing weather. Both years' treacherous snowfall has quickly given way to lethal ice. Last February there were extraordinary scenes on the seven river crossings, when giant sheets of falling ice crashed onto the roadway below. This year, despite warnings from the authorities, nine people died after venturing out onto frozen ponds and waterways, only for the ice to crack and plunge them into freezing water. In Cornwall, after black ice led a coach to skid off the road, the police car called to the scene also lost control on the same patch of ice. It's gonna go into that car down there, that Honda, or whatever it is. In fact, all over the country, cars and vehicles were sliding out of control. He's under the car, he's under the car. This winter has seen conditions every bit as dangerous as last winter, but with a crucial difference. This time, they've lasted much longer. So why did the snow hang around for so long? The answer lies in a system of high-altitude winds that encircle the globe. The dominant force is a 100-mile-wide river of air at 36,000 feet called the jet stream. Its position over Britain controls our weather. This cold spell's lasted, lingered so long across, across our parts of the world because weather patterns are kind of stuck. The jet streams are stuck in a very static position, not moving along very fast. Well, you can see the chart here fairly clearly. Big, powerful jet stream running across the central Atlantic there. This big block, this solid lump up here where there's virtually no wind, then another jet stream coming down across parts of Scandinavia and Russia. That block in the middle is effectively just like putting a boulder in the middle of a river. Nothing can flow through it, so the weather sticks as well, and all the weather flows around it rather than through it, and hence why we've been stuck in this very cold spell for a long period. And it's not until we get rid of that boulder is that things begin to flow through and we can start to get to the proper milder winter. To figure out how our snowstorms start, we need to look 20,000 feet above our heads. It's what happens up there that determines what sort of snowflakes will blanket our country. This winter's big freeze across Britain started about four miles up in the sky. Any slight temperature change up there makes a big difference to the type of snow we get down here. Experts at Reading University's Department of Meteorology study the anatomy of snow. They've been monitoring the weather here for almost a century. We've been making weather observations here every morning uh, and maximum and minimum temperatures, snow depth since 1920. Since then, they've learned a lot about how snow is formed. Snow crystals start life nearly four miles up in the clouds. Clouds we've got up above us at the moment, you see, it's little water drops in there. 
and then the odd one will freeze and once it starts changes to ice it's a bit like you know when you have a children's uh, chemistry set where you make crystals copper sulfate you have a solution the crystals won't grow but you just drop a little seed in so you need a little hexagonal speck of dust and there's one in a million of the drops will start to freeze and they grow and then they start to fall out. When it gets to about minus five, because obviously as we fall it's getting warmer, then these crystals start interlocking. We get bigger and bigger flakes because the snow is sticky. When they hit each other they stick and you get your snowflakes falling out. The traditional snowflake shape is called a dendrite, but not all snow looks like this. With snow samples on their doorstep, here at Reading, they use an electron microscope to examine the nature of different snow crystals. Well, on the, the screen here, we've got a, a simple hexagonal uh, prism, which is really the sort of shape that, that water crystals want to be. All of these other shapes, a lot of them are going to be edge-on versions of this one that we're looking at. There's only about 8% water in snow. Most of the rest of it is just air, which is why snow is so light. All the different shapes come from the basic hexagon that water molecules combine to form when they freeze. All of the other sorts of exciting shapes really is the result of varying conditions of temperature and the amount of uh, water in the atmosphere affecting the way that the crystals can grow. When snow falls, it's the temperature that determines the sort of snow we get. If it's below minus 5 Celsius, it'll be light and powdery. If it's closer to zero, the snow is sticky. Well, the snow here fell with a temperature very close to freezing, so it's full of quite large flakes and it's quite sticky snow. So if I pick up some of this snow, then it's wonderful stuff, isn't it? I can, especially for kids, because I make a nice snowball and have great fun. When it's below minus 5, you pick up the snow, and it's very dry, and it's not sticky at all. You make a snowball, but it's all falls to bits again. The type of snow is critical to the damage it might do. When it's sticky snow, what happens is it builds up on everything. So you probably saw each telephone wire had a large amount of snow on. And of course that will bring down electric cables. Whereas if it's minus five, it's powder snow. And of course the powder snow has its own problems, because the powder blows around. And this was what was happening with the Eurostar powder is blown everywhere and was being ingested and getting inside the engine and of course when it went into the warm tunnel it melted and shorted out the electricity. And if snow starts to melt and then freezes again that's when it can cause real damage to the roads because water expands by 10% when it freezes. Now this is what happens in the in the roads the water gets into the nooks and crannies expands forces it open, an enormous force, melts, expands again. So it's this cycle that causes the damage to the roads and so forth, of melting and refreezing and melting and refreezing. We may think that we've had two bad winters, but the truth is, we've had far worse. In the past, Britain has faced cold spells that have lasted not just for weeks, but months. This is how snowed up Britain looks from the air. And here's Leicester's mainline station. But where are the trains? Heading back towards London over the countryside, we find the trains marooned in the deep snow. In 1947, austerity Britain shivered in one of the worst winters on record. From January the 22nd to March the 17th, snow fell every day somewhere in the UK. As the heaviest snowfalls for 130 years cut off large areas of the country, in the Midlands, it reached six feet deep the Air Force was called in to drop emergency supplies. The onslaught of snow battered a country struggling to recover from the Second World War. With roads blocked, coal supplies were stranded at the collieries. Britain faced an energy crisis. Emergency legislation cut electricity supplies, television was shut down, and Buckingham Palace reduced to working by candlelight. As the freeze dragged on, even the food supply was under threat. The frost never went away. The snow came down, it got compacted, the frost was very severe. Another batch of heavy snow came on top of that, and so the ground was getting colder and colder and colder. The farmers couldn't dig up the crops, and so there was a near famine in this country by the end of the winter.
but this was make do and mend Britain. And at least frozen lakes and ponds offered light relief. The worst spell of weather for 50 years. We hope it'll be 50 more before we get another. But Britain didn't have to wait for 50 years. The winter of 1963 was destined to be another record breaker. Although there was less snow than in 1947, it was the coldest winter since 1740. Three people died battling against the snow and two more were suffocated in a snowbound car. In Braemar, Aberdeenshire, the mercury plummeted to minus 22.2 degrees Celsius, an icy low that was matched again this year. And nationwide, mean temperatures barely hovered above freezing. It was cold enough that even the sea froze over and there were reports even of people managing to drive across the Thames at Windsor. Nineteen sixty three was so much worse than anything we saw this winter or last. The big freeze then lasted far longer, all the way into March. Britain's infrastructure took a battering. The roads and railways were impassable, and once again the crops froze in the fields. Every time there's a severe winter, the number of deaths rises. One of the greatest dangers is hypothermia. I want to find out how the human body reacts to extreme cold and to discover firsthand what it feels like when your core body temperature drops. To do that, I've travelled to Scotland and Britain's snowiest place the 4,000-foot peaks of the Cairngorms. The higher you climb, the colder it gets, and in winter, it's not uncommon for temperatures to fall below minus 20 degrees Celsius. Winds hit hurricane force, causing the wind chill to plummet to an astonishing minus 70. Trapped in these conditions, it'd be hard to survive for more than half an hour. In the last 10 years, over 70 people have lost their lives to the vicious weather up here. Today, I'm in good hands. The Cairngorm Mountain Rescue Team has 43 highly trained members, all of whom volunteer their time and skills to save anyone in trouble on the mountains. The team carries out regular training exercises on the summit of Cairngorm. Today, I'm the casualty and they're going to show me just how quickly freezing cold can overwhelm the human body. I can't actually believe this is Britain. But it is, it's Scotland. Welcome to the Cairngorms. As we trek out onto the training site, it's minus 10, and the wind is gusting to around 50 miles an hour, creating a wind chill that feels about minus 27. They say this is actually a fairly average sort of day. It can be pretty bad and uh, very demoralising, and that's one of the things that really starts to kick in, is people you know, begin to lose a bit of hope. They don't know where they are, they're frightened, so it's, uh, it's, it's all building towards a bad result for them, you know? I, I can see that if I was here on my own, it would be a, a living nightmare very quickly. If I was lost up here, hypothermia would be my biggest fear. Team doctor Peter Grant gives me a practical demonstration of just how quickly it can set in. Well, take off your, your gloves, OK? What's, what's the temperature like just now, Simon? 36.9. OK. They'll monitor my body temperature so I don't get into real trouble. Normally it would be 37 degrees Celsius, but just a two degree drop to 35 would mean I'm becoming hypothermic. You're getting cold now, aren't you? I am cold. <laughs> Remember, it's blowing a gale, and the wind chill is about minus 27 degrees Celsius. The body tries very hard to conserve the energy towards the core, to the, the important bits of you, the, the heart and the, the brain. Yeah. That's why you can't, can't feel your fingers anymore. Yeah. This must be distinctly uncomfortable now. 
Actually, no, yeah, no, I'm starting to um, get quite chilly now. My head is seriously cold now. Yeah. 36.5 at Just the moment, Peter. Here. 36.5. OK. If it, if it happens quickly like this, you're, you're very aware of getting cold. If it happens more slowly, morely, more insidiously, then you don't tend to have, have as much of an, an awareness and you don't tend to feel all that uncomfortable. Sometimes you'll paradoxically just start undressing, taking your, your clothes off once you get really cold. Um, and that, of course, just is part of a downward spiral that there's no way out of. My way out of this is to get dressed and get out of this wind. Yeah, you're starting to shiver. Yeah. I think it's time we maybe stop this and got you warmed up now, eh? Not a bad idea. Yeah, actually. OK. The rescue team always carries these portable tents so that hypothermic patients can be treated on the scene out of this unbelievably cold wind. Oh, wow. Find it straight out of yeah. the wind. Let's, do, let's just get a reading from that, uh, that thermometer now. OK. And then we can get rid of that. Yeah. It's actually dropped, but it's 35.1. Okay. Okay. I'm now on the verge of hypothermia. Yeah. If I was on my own, I could be in real trouble. And I can't stop shivering. You've started shivering now yeah. as that cold blood has started to come back into, into the core. Okay? That shivering will help to generate some, uh, some energy that will start getting your temperature uh, up again. Up. I mean, you wouldn't last long, would you? Not at all. No. Yeah. For me, this was just an experiment. I knew I was in a controlled environment. Others have not been so lucky. But snow doesn't just freeze you. It can bury and suffocate too. I'm Nick Middleton, and I'm on a journey to investigate why we've had such a severe winter and the threat posed by extreme snow. Britain's mountains look stunning in the snow, but they harbour one of the most powerful and destructive forces of nature, the avalanche. The dangers and risks are continually assessed here at the Scottish Avalanche Information Service in Aviemore. Most victims trigger their own avalanche. It doesn't have to be big, just one or two metres wide and a 50 metre slide is enough to carry a victim down, surrounded by hundreds of tonnes of snow. Anyone buried must be dug out fast. The chances of survival are just 30% if the victim isn't rescued within the first 15 minutes. I volunteered for just a small taste of how this might feel. I've got a lot of snow on my face which is deeply unpleasant. Stinging, stinging actually. Really nasty. And I was amazed at how little snow it took to paralyse me completely. How much snow is there on top of me? On my legs, say. A foot? Six inches? I can't move my leg. Really heavy, isn't it? If my head was under the snow, I'd have no chance of freeing myself and would die of asphyxiation within a matter of minutes. Avalanches are lethal and indiscriminate, and so the work of the prediction team at Aviemore is vital. Their forecasts are based on a computer model which analyses the risks according to the climatic conditions. The model compares conditions of the forecast day with past days in its database that have produced avalanches. The data for the model are continually updated by measurements out on the mountain. Cathy Grindrod is one of the team collecting the field data. In Scotland, avalanche conditions can change within half a day. So, like, one of us goes out every single day between mid-December and mid-April. Whether it rain, hail, shine, 100 mile an hour winds, we have to go out. Right, my next temperature is minus 7.3. Cathy is analysing the different layers of snow within the pack. 
Some are hard as concrete, compacted by the wind. Others have the consistency of dry, powdery sugar. These are the weak layers. They cause avalanches. Weaknesses are formed in a number of ways. This one is made up of these tiny, rounded snow crystals called graupel. A graupel is a round-up snowflake. They're a bit like hailstones, so as it's carried on the wind and the moisture in the air, it makes it into a little round ball. But they can cause a weakness in the snow pack. These are like ball bearings, so it's the, the layer above it can slide off very easily. There can be several of these weak layers in a snow pack. Over time, more hard, compacted snow builds up on top, burying the dangerous weak layer, making it impossible to see from the surface. Eventually, one of the layers gives way, either through sheer weight of snow or triggered by an unsuspecting climber or skier. The huge mass of snow on top literally slides off. This is an avalanche. I'm only putting very light pressure. When the snow is this unstable, the risks are very high. So I identified another weak layer. So there you go, and look how cleanly that actually came away. So today we're going to keep it as a category four, um, which means it's a high avalanche risk. And if you're on anything quite steep, large snow slopes, um, you, you could quite easily trigger an avalanche. And that's happened many times this winter in Britain's mountains. One of them was in the northwest highlands of Scotland. In December, climber Olly Sanderson planned a hike up to the Lyotak Ridge in the Torridon Mountains. Experienced climber Chris Asthill would be his partner. It was to be a day that Ollie will never forget. Started up the path. It was a little faint in places, you know, there'd been a bit of snow the night before. The kind of higher up we got, the more snow there was on the ground. So the going was a little bit slower than we imagined, but again, you know, it just added to the, the challenge of the day, really. They'd done their homework. The weather forecast was good, and the avalanche risk that day was low to moderate. And there's a, a gully at the face, uh, and in the summer there's a path that kind of zigzags up it. Ollie led the way as they climbed up the gully. I got to the top and looked behind and Chris's, you know, at my heels as I expected. So we just stopped for a moment at the top, um, got a breath back really, just discussed the route ahead. Chris was eager to, to, to get ahead and lead the next bit. As Chris heads off, there's, there's a crack, uh, a horizontal crack in the snow, maybe 20 feet ahead of Chris, um, that just zigzags across from one side of the top of the gully to the other. Um, and we both know instantly what it is. As I'm falling with the avalanche, and it, it's a slab avalanche, so it was only maybe 20 centimetres deep. So it's not actually, um, a, you know, a massive amount of snow in it, um, but it's the, it's the speed that it happens. Um, and uh, you, you just feel like you're in kind of sludge, uh, and it's moving you, you know, backwards, back towards the gully. Ollie could see the exposed rocks in the gully, and he knew he had to try to get out. And as I then move to my left, somehow I stop with my poles jammed in the earth, and I look round, and, and there's no sign of Chris at all. Ollie called Mountain Rescue to get help, and set off to look for Chris. I move my way back down the gully and um, obviously all the time I'm conscious now that uh, I could trigger another avalanche. The main thing that's going through my mind was, was that I needed to find Chris and I hoped to God that he'd still be alive. After walking for half an hour, Ollie spotted something. I kind of run towards this figure uh, and, and it's Chris and he's sat there in the snow. Um, but clearly he's, he's, he's dazed. He doesn't know who I am. Chris was injured and couldn't move. Ollie did all he could to keep him warm. I keep talking to him and uh, I'm, you know, I'm telling him to, to, 
stay with me and stay alive and, and, and everything. By now, a Coast Guard rescue helicopter was on its way. I hear what is still probably the most beautiful sound in the world of the helicopter propellers. It's just the most amazing kind of feeling when it's there, you know, it's like these kind of heroes in the sky coming to, to rescue you. Chris was rushed to Inverness Hospital for emergency treatment. And then, uh, and then we get the phone call and uh, she says that, that Chris hasn't uh, managed to pull through and, um, you know, he's... He's um, it basically he got hypothermia and they just weren't able to um, to raise his core temperature. Chris is uh, Chris was um, an absolute character. His, his experience was it was almost second to none really. But obviously the mountains got no no respect for experience really in situations like this. Each winter, an average of twenty people in Britain are caught in avalanches. Fortunately, most survive. But you don't have to be on top of a mountain to be at risk from snow and ice. Back on the streets of Britain's towns and villages, the snow and ice brought other dangers. From sledging accidents to simply slipping on the pavement, hospitals up and down the country were pushed to the limit. Leicester Royal Infirmary was typical. Here, the busiest part of the hospital this winter was the fracture clinic. And the injuries show just how easy it is to take a fall. Happened last night, I went out to the dustbin and just slipped on the ice. I'd just been walking to a neighbour's to visit them Christmas evening, cut on my way back and slipped over and broke my wrist. I stood for the car coming. And all of a sudden, I went bang. That's it. We've seen a huge increase in these sorts of injuries, both with ankles and wrists. Over the past couple of months, we've treated 2,500 people with injuries that have related to the weather, slipping on the ice. And it wasn't just the elderly who were losing their balance. We've seen everything from the age of about 20 to 25, um, all wrist fractures, all ankle fractures. Um, so we've had a huge increase of younger people. All these injuries, acquired in just an instant, will take a long time to heal. So somebody with this injury is looking at three months at least for the injury to actually repair fully enough for them to go back to their normal everyday activities. Yes, I'm in it for another... A good couple of months now, by the look of it. About six weeks. six weeks. Do you have to come that far? Yes. yes. For a long time after the snow and ice have disappeared, many people across the country will still be suffering the consequences. Oh, that's OK, thank you very much. Still, this winter, it's not as bad as 1963. 1963? I wasn't, I wasn't around. Right? <laughs> eh? <laughs> There's no doubt that winter is a dangerous time in Britain. For many of us, the greatest danger is on the roads. So it's a high priority to keep them clear. This year, gritters in Britain have covered a total of 1.7 million miles, spreading one of the most common minerals on Earth. I went to Cheshire to see where most of it comes from. This stuff may look a bit like snow, but it's not. It's actually what you might call snow's most deadly enemy. It's salt. Without it, every time it snowed, we really would be in trouble. Although we still call it gritting, the grit was replaced by salt over 50 years ago. It works by lowering the freezing point of water by just enough to prevent melting snow or rain turning into ice on the road surface. The salt deposits here in Cheshire were formed by an ancient sea that evaporated over 220 million years ago. Today, getting at it is no mean feat. Some 1,500 feet down, these tunnels now extend for nearly 130 miles. This continuous mining machine excavates nearly 12 tonnes an hour. 
there's enough salt down here to last at least another 500 years. But even with plentiful supplies, getting it from the mine to our roads can be a problem. To be most effective, the salt should be scattered before the snow falls. So local councils responsible for gritting must anticipate the bad weather. With the icy conditions uh, continuing for weeks on end, they still need more and more salt every day, and uh, the stocks are actually getting dangerously low. They're pretty low um, here in this warehouse now. There's a limit to how much salt councils can stockpile, and this winter, deliveries from the mines have struggled to keep up with the relentless demand. With roads needing treatment up to six times a day during heavy snowfalls, it's easy to see how stocks of salt get used up. In just a few weeks this winter, our roads have consumed an astonishing 200,000 tonnes of salt. But Britain has not been on its own in suffering an extreme winter. Much of the Northern Hemisphere has been unusually cold. How does that happen in a world that's supposedly warming up? This winter hasn't just been hard for Britain. It's been unusually severe around most of the Northern Hemisphere. Temperatures plummeted, breaking records from the USA to Russia. Some countries coped better than others. It's a line you keep hearing. Why does snow and ice always take Britain by surprise? The simple truth is, we don't have enough bad winters. People in Beijing, New York and Moscow have all been hit hard. But these places are much more used to these conditions. Moscow temperatures, for example, regularly dive down to minus 15 Celsius. If you live somewhere like Moscow, it's very continental. It doesn't really matter which way the wind's coming. It's going to be cold and it's going to be snowy at times. So it's much easier for them because they get the snow every single year. So Muscovites have invested heavily to fight their annual battle with nature. 2,500 snowplows are ready to roll into action. And specially designed snow gathering machines suddenly appear on the streets. Behind them come trucks, ready to take the snow away from the city. An army of 50,000 workers keep Moscow's roads passable. They make vital electrical contacts work, so public transport networks stay open. And Russian mothers scoff at the idea of closing schools and send the kids off each morning. When it's bad, Muscovites simply put snow chains on their shoes. It is much easier to walk with the ice walkers. It makes you feel uh, that you're a lot less likely to get home with a broken limb. New York, too, has snow every year and is just as well prepared. Thousands of snowplows and hundreds of salt spreaders are at the ready. In extreme snow conditions, teams work round the clock to keep the roads free. Planes have their wings doused with antifreeze to brave the sub-zero temperatures. And when the weather becomes impossible, New York declares a snow day. Schools automatically close and commuters take the day off, knowing they'll make up the lost time when the blizzard ceases. Wherever you look around the world, the places that know that they'll be in for a hard winter have invested in the equipment to deal with it. Has the time come for us to do the same? When you get a relatively rare occurrence like this, the question really to be asked is, are we prepared to spend a great deal of money on machinery and, and time and effort, really for something that's going to happen quite rarely? But this winter and last, Britain has seen extreme snow and ice. If this is the new face of British winters, it may be tempting to ask if our climate is getting colder. If so, what happened to global warming? The cold winters of the last couple of years, whilst really quite different for us in recent decades, don't really have any, anything to do with global warming. 
there's always this tendency to link weather directly with climate. There is a link, obviously, because climate is essentially the summation of all the weather that's happened over a long period of time. When we're talking about a weather forecast, we're talking about a little place for a short period of time and very tightly focused. When you're talking about climate and you're looking at building up all the information you have from weather and plugging it into give you an average for the entire planet. That average can accommodate some pretty wide swings in temperature from one year to the next. So scientists are very cautious about linking a couple of cold winters to climate change. The global warming experts have put across this story that for the next 50, 100 years, certainly, it's just going to get warmer and snow is going to become a thing of the past. That is certainly not the case. In my opinion, we're not going to see that situation. I still think that we will see snow events, pretty heavy ones on occasions as well. We are in a temperate latitude. We're not too far away from the poles. We are not just suddenly going to go into a, a Mediterranean climate because one thing to remember is this. Nice has snow and Nice is far further south than we are. So it seems we have the worst of both worlds. While the globe is warming up, we can still get extremely cold winters. However much our lives are disrupted by severe winter weather, perhaps we should be thankful we're not alive 400 years ago. Back then, Britain was in the grip of the Little Ice Age. This really was climate change, not just a cold spell. For several hundred years, average temperatures in Britain dropped by one degree compared to previous centuries. In 1683, the Thames was frozen for two months. Harbours were frozen around the coast. Crops failed. There was famine and disease. It certainly puts this winter into perspective. Yes, we've had a bad period. Yes, we've had airports shut at times. Yes, we've had roads closed at times. But overall, we have generally speaking coped with it. And it's been good for us, perhaps, to have a little bit of a wake-up call, to realise that we are somewhat smaller than the weather, and the weather will always come along and give us a wee bit of a kick up the bum and say, you know, actually, I'm still here, guys. If we're tempted to think the worst of our weather this winter, we should remember that weather and climate are complicated subjects. Two extreme winters in a row do not mean that global warming isn't happening. And who knows, there may be another severe winter next year. It could be that severe winters are just something we'll have to get used to. Major new drama tonight from 10 o'clock on 4. Juliana Margulies back on top with her performance of The Good Wife. Now next tonight, Vinny and Ivana in a very uncompromising position. Celebrity Big Brother.